This is where Julius Caesar made two unsuccessful attempts to invade Britain in 55 and 54 BC. In both cases, he met fierce opposition and was forced to leave within a year. Nearly a hundred years later, the Romans finally arrived on these shores. They discovered a society thousands of years older than their own. Why was this country so desirable that Roman emperors risked so much to conquer it? Who were these people, so fiercely independent that they'd held up the Roman army for a hundred years? What was Britain BC? I've been studying the archaeology of pre-Roman Britain all of my life. And one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by the subject is that I wasn't taught it at school. As a nation, we reject our ancient past, believing that our proper history started with the Romans. But there's an unexplored story to tell, the story of Britain BC. Well, it's always said that the Romans did an enormous amount for Britain. But did they? I mean, they gave us roads. Did they? I don't think they did at all. We had perfectly good roads before the Romans came. They gave us language. No, they didn't. We had a perfectly good language before the Latin arrived. They gave us laws. No, our laws weren't written down, but we had them. So they gave us civilization. No. They didn't give us civilization. We were civilized before the Romans came here. It was the Romans who started all this barbarian nonsense. Their armies marched their way across Europe, labeling everything they saw uncivilized. Britain was considered to be particularly backward and strange. To find out more about this, I went to see my old friend and sparring partner, Guy de la Bédéière, a Roman supporter if ever I saw one. Guy, I find it hard to believe that the sea actually came up there. If you've been able to stand here and look that way, Francis, yeah. on a clear day you could have seen France and the Roman soldiers in their ships coming across in the year 43. That's if you've been stupid enough to stand here waiting for them. <laughs> the real problem is, is this the only place they landed? Yeah. Did they really land here on the first day, or did they land in several places at once? And the best clue we've got right. are the remains of a triumphal arch. Now, that's the sort of thing the Romans would have put up to commemorate yeah. a really important event. The symbolic gateway to Roman Britain. Why were the Romans interested in Britain? Florus talks about Britain being such a useless, ruddy, low remote location, how wonderful the Roman Empire was to come here. We're absolutely on the edge of the known world. Yeah. There's a huge box office sales yeah. potential in yeah. coming here and bragging about having been here. Mm, they always used to brag quite a lot, didn't they, the Romans? Well, I think they had a lot to be proud of. <laughs> you do? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I. I... I'd see that as a rather sad symbol myself. I think the ordinary man in the street, presented with the sort of stability and security and financial mm. system the Romans offered, if we think about the American system today, mm. we might not like it, but actually most people, given push and shove, will accept that more than they will having instability and insecurity. And I think that means for ordinary people, mm. it's very easy to see why they might have sat there whinging about the good old days and how they'd love to be back where they were before, while at the same time swigging Roman wine from a Roman cup in a nice Roman building with a nice Roman roof with a nice Roman central heating system. Having lost their independence. Well, we Having lost their self-esteem. What the Romans wiped out was a 10,000-year-old island culture, quite unlike any other in the ancient world. And for centuries, the reality of ancient Britain has remained veiled in mystery and confusion. The sheer energy of this culture is embodied for me by Maiden Castle in Dorset. This hill fort was seen as a site of a battle between the Romans and the Britons. In fact, it tells a much older story. 
Maiden Castle has to be the most massive and spectacular pre-Roman site in Britain. And it's come to symbolize the vanished world of the Iron Age. But it was never as simple as that. This site was actually occupied for 4,000 years before the Roman invasion. This is a huge stretch of time, which spans all the archaeological eras. The great hill fort defences were built in the Iron Age, which began 700 years before the Roman invasion. In the Bronze Age, which goes back to around 2,500 years BC, to when the pyramids of Egypt were built, people were living here, burying their dead in round barrows. And we know for a fact that a ceremonial meeting place was constructed here around 4,000 BC, right back in the Stone Age. The Stone Age is the longest archaeological period and dates back to when humans first walked the Earth some two million years ago. When I became an archaeologist, I wasn't interested in excavating the ancient sites of Egypt, Greece or Rome. I wanted to investigate the far more mysterious story of ancient Britain. This story is not told in our history books. It's not even in the national curriculum. Take the British Museum, this vast, imposing building. It still only has a tiny part of its floor space devoted to ancient Britain. Yes, this is a great Roman gallery that really represents wonderful treasures from Roman Britain. Fabulous material, all that glass and silver. It says a great deal about Roman Britain. This is back into barbarian Britain, isn't it? I feel Egypt. more at home with this. Absolutely. <laughs> Caroline, for me, this has to be one of the glories of the British Museum. It's an absolutely stunning object. How come we haven't got more British prehistoric stuff on display? Before about 1850, the world that's perceived by the British Museum collecting was one of Greek and Rome, um, of the Bible lands, of ancient Egypt, and then the Oriental. And the native artefacts of Britain, our own, if you like, dirty, grubby native history, simply wasn't considered to be important. So this would be considered barbarian stuff and not worth displaying? Totally barbarian. And in fact, the empire was busy uh, having conquests over yeah. people bearing shields like that. Of course, yeah. it, it wasn't considered to be very sophisticated. For most people, the idea of ancient Britain conjures up visions of romantic, misty landscapes, strange myths and legends. A Braveheart meets Lord of the Rings type of thing. And most of us have been led to believe that this land was once populated by a red-haired group of rather artistic warriors known as the Celts. These ideas are now proven to be fantasy. What we think of as a Celtic past is largely an invention and it's largely a fiction. The term Celtic we can trace back to at least four or five hundred BC, but it seems until about 1700 never to have been used about the people of Britain or Ireland. It's always just used of people living actually on the continent. At that time, people were starting to understand that there were important connections between. Uh, our prehistoric ancestors in Britain and those on the continent. And in the first instance, people came to understand that their languages had apparently been similar. From that, people started to use this linguistic term as an ethnic label. I can remember when I was at college, we learned that the Celts spread from Central Europe. I think what we do see is the movement of uh, or the expansion from Central Europe of certain cultural traits, particularly in the physical things people were using, um, so-called Celtic art, as we call it today. From the first, the weapons of the Celts, especially their swords, were good enough to make them a strong fighting power. 
you could see so-called Celtic sword as being rather the equivalent of a, a BMW car today. Yeah. And the fact that lots of people in Britain drive around in BMW cars does not mean we've been invaded from Germany. But that's just the mistake that some archaeologists have made about British prehistory. We seem to be in some strange form of denial about our ancient past, where everything good has to come from across the channel. A little less than 4,000 years ago, the country was invaded by many warlike bands. These invaders already used metal, and their coming encouraged the growth of the bronze industry in this country. This is now known to be false, even with Stonehenge. People used to believe that Stonehenge was introduced to Britain from either ancient Egypt or Crete. These notions have been radically overturned. New developments in archaeology are beginning to discover the real story of ancient Britain. Separated from the rest of Europe, Britain developed in a unique and particular way. It is this uniquely British culture, unique in its beliefs and rituals, in its houses and monuments, in its technology, agriculture and industry, and in its emphasis on family and ancestry that I want people to rediscover. So let's go back in time and uncover the ancient culture we didn't know we had. The Iron Age only lasted for 700 years before the Romans came. At this time, Britain was a country with a rapidly growing population. Communities came together to build defensive hill forts like Maiden Castle and to create some of the most beautiful works of art in the ancient world. The British Bronze Age goes back another 2,000 years. The invention of bronze had kick-started an industrial revolution on a massive scale. Bronze tools made it easier for Britons to construct complex wood and stone structures, many built as strange religious monuments. The Stone Age occupies the remaining years and takes us right back to when this country first became an island. And it was in the Stone Age that Britain discovered something which was to transform life on this island forever. The invention of farming has to be the single most important development in human history. Once people had gained control of food production, their lives changed beyond recognition. it became possible to settle down and construct fixed societies. Farming was the key to our prosperity. I think that's it straight ahead. Yeah. It was an ancient British farming community that I discovered in East Anglia. While I was looking at some aerial photos of Flag Fen, I noticed something very unusual. Two parallel crop marks caused by ancient ditches of some kind. What I was to find here clashed with conventional ideas about the origins of farming. To explain, I must go right back to a time when Britain wasn't even an island. It's 10,000 years ago, and we're at the end of the Ice Age. As the ice melts, sea levels rise. Britain is becoming an island, isolated from the rest of Europe. Our isolation persuaded archaeologists that all new developments must have come from abroad. This revolution, the beginning of farming, did not take place in Europe, but in the Near East, in the river valleys and along the coastline shown on this map. These new farmers gradually migrated westwards across Europe. When I was a student, we were taught that farming arrived pretty well fully formed from the eastern Mediterranean, and it had spread across Europe around 5000 BC. We were running around in skins, being sort of hunters and gatherers, sort of savages, if you like, and then suddenly this enormous improvement arrived, and people even called it the Neolithic or farming revolution, and things changed overnight, and it was dramatic and wonderful. 
This great revolution was the most important change in all human history. But there was no such revolution, because the origins of farming had been forming in this country for thousands of years. New research now proves that right from the beginning we did things rather differently. 9,000 years ago, in the Vale of Pickering, Yorkshire, there was a hunting and living site on the edge of a huge post-Ice Age lake. Star Car was inhabited by humans 4,000 years before the pyramids were built. What was found has made me even more certain that the origins of British farming lay on British soil. Tim Shadler Hall has excavated here. So we're in the middle of the lake, are we? Yeah. Um, prove it. Well, I can prove it in all sorts of ways, but this yeah. is basically filled with peat. Yeah. You stand Thank there. You, Ooh. <laughs> you can feel the peat. It's like, that's, yeah. it's like being on jelly. It's about three Do it again, that was rather good. It's about <laughs> three metres of peat, which yeah. is the whole history of the lake. That's fantastic. Well, where does it stop? It stops just as the ground rises, and the site we're going to look at is just beyond there. Right, let's go for it. Huge numbers of animal bones were found here, and amongst these were dozens of dog bones. Now we're actually reaching the level at which all the occupation at Star Car took place. In fact, we're almost on the site. Because there's a lot less bounce here. Well, there's no there. bounce at all, because it's hard ground. You know, we've got the lake behind. Yeah. We would be coming into a sort of reed swamp, yeah. and then you'd be right through into open water. Open water. You've got a perfect landscape. You've got open water, you've got lowland, yeah. you've got potentially good grazing, you've got wood, you've got lots of areas where you can find wild animals, and the lake never goes away. They're burning the lake edges in order to encourage animals. So burning off reed? Burning off reed, yeah. get young shoots, it's perfect for food, it's good for hunting. I'm very intrigued about the three dogs. Because we've got more dogs now, I think, than anywhere else. They're all dated to about 7,000 BC. They're obviously used for hunting, all of which have been identified as being domesticated dogs rather than European wolves. Archaeologists have always believed that these dogs were only used for hunting, to chase and retrieve prey. But I believe they were doing quite a lot more than that. It actually sounds like you're talking about an extremely sophisticated society. I rather think of them as people adopting the principle of least effort. They're intelligent like us, they do no more than they need to, they have a larder around them, and they're going to just go for it. Their population levels are low enough for them to have a very pleasant life, to exploit the environment, and effectively, in my view, farm it. I was delighted to find this out at Star Car. Years of working as a sheep farmer had already convinced me that these prehistoric dogs would have been used not only to hunt, but also to herd prey, just like sheepdogs do today. I got into sheep farming mainly because I got fed up reading accounts of prehistoric farmers written by archaeologists who couldn't tell one end of a sheep from another. a small farm and started to use ancient techniques. I soon found that it was no good without a dog. If I didn't have a dog, the sheep were running all over the place. But I read in all the textbooks that prehistoric sheep can't be worked by a dog. But my ancient primitive sheep hadn't read the textbooks. I found that primitive sheep can be worked by a dog. My sheepdog, Jess, is not very different from the dogs whose remains were found at Star Car. Don't forget that border collies are actually descended from wolves, like all other dogs. What Jess is doing now is she's rounding up the sheep to bring to me the top dog, in her mind, to kill. I'll then kill the prey, in her mind, and then I'll throw it to the other wolves in the pack. 
Now, there isn't a huge difference between what I do with Jess and what the people at Star Car 9,000 years ago would have done with their hunting dogs. Look back! Look back, Jess! Essentially, we are both manipulating animals for our own use. Stay there. So the difference in that case between hunting and farming is really remarkably slight. The dog bones found at Star Car prove that the ancient Britons were managing animals 4,000 years before the so-called farming invasion. Within Cheddar Gorge are some of the oldest caves in Britain. It was here that scientists found something which was to shake the archaeological world. This is where Arthur Gough discovered what is still the oldest complete skeleton in the British Isles. He found it in 1903, and then in the 1980s, the bones were radiocarbon dated and were shown to be a staggering 9,000 years old. That's a few centuries after the Ice Age. But the really exciting thing happened in 1997 when these bones, which became known as Cheddar Man, were analyzed for mitochondrial DNA by Oxford University. Unlike regular DNA that combines genetic matter from both male and female parents, mitochondrial DNA is only inherited through the female line. Mitochondrial DNA you only get from your mother. So I got mine from my mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother. So there's an unbroken line stretching way back into the past. Because this mitochondrial DNA changes very little over the generations, it's an excellent way of tracing origins. Sykes has used it to track the origins of the main populations of Europe. Mitochondrial DNA were once bacteria that were free-living and then millions of years ago got into cells and then allowed cells to use oxygen and they're still there. So they have a separate kind of history from the nuclear chromosomes and it's that which gives us this really good way of tracking back through the maternal line. What astounded the archaeological world was that Cheddar Man's DNA was identical to that of a number of people living in the local area today. It brought home the point that it was almost exactly the same as somebody living in the same village. So the DNA from those really old um, specimens, and uh, Cheddar Man 9,000 years old, is identical to the DNA in people living in Britain now. This set the archaeological world twittering, because the textbook said that the native Ice Age inhabitants had all been driven away by waves of people coming from the continent who brought with them farming. If the hunter-gatherers had been swept away by the incoming farmers, then you would expect the DNA from pre-farming skeletons to be very different to the present day. Well, we showed farmers hadn't replaced the population that was there previously. We're carrying, if you like, the history of our species around with us. When we realise we've got the real stuff that they carry around in their own bodies, with us today, I think that's an insight which I hadn't contemplated or expected. If Sykes was right, then the Ice Age people survived, and their culture survived as well. And it's that which fascinates me. Crops, livestock and ideas were introduced to this country from the Near East. But this wasn't a violent invasion. The people of Britain had been managing animals in their own particular way for thousands of years. It was the remains of their unique farming system which had appeared in those aerial photos of Flag Fen. 
These dark marks are the remains of an ancient landscape. Now, if you were driving along this road here and you looked out of your car window, you wouldn't see a thing because the ground would be completely flat. What you see from the air are the roots of the crops going down and tapping into the water below the ground. The plants grow more vigorously over the ancient ditches and show up as darker lines from the air. One of the most interesting is a pair of ditches over here. Now, those ditches, we now realise, went on either side of a droveway, which is a highly sophisticated form of trackway for moving large numbers of animals from one part of the farm to the other. This is essential for farming. Today, we rely on barbed wire and electric fences. But the ancient British farmers had designed something that did the work of all of this equipment. This is a droveway, and it's reconstructed exactly as it would have been in the Bronze Age, with ditches and hedges on either side. Now, it was intended to drive animals, hundreds of them, from one part of the farm to another. And it was in use for about a thousand years, so it must have worked really well. There are field systems like this right across Britain, but they are nowhere to be found on the continent. It was a truly British invention. The unique style of farming in Britain gives us a special opportunity to understand how society was organized. Now, essentially, everything was small scale and based on cooperation between the different farming families. It was in nobody's interest to have large scale confrontation. And until the six centuries or so before the coming of the Romans, there were no kings, princes, or powerful controlling elites. Those are the great old Bronze Age copper mines, and this has to be the maddest way to view an archaeological site. This railway was built in Victorian times. The mine down there is from a far earlier industrial age. It was discovered in North Wales on the peninsula of Great Orme. The introduction and use of bronze around 2500 BC had a colossal impact. This was the first true age of metal. Bronze is strong but very malleable. These new implements were capable of so much more than the tools of the Stone Age. This really was Britain's first industrial revolution. People always thought that these huge mines were Roman. In actual fact, work began on this great open shaft nearly 4,000 years ago. It's mind-boggling to conceive of how these ancient Britons set about such a vast and complex task. So, Sean, what exactly is it that you get out of the ground to get copper? It's malachite, copper carbonate, and that's what they find, and they eventually have to smelt it in to yeah. make the pure copper. There are about six stages right. that take it from the solid rock that you see here yeah. to finally create the finished product. I've read they use bone tools as well. This is a limb bone from a cow. It's one of the 30,000 found throughout the whole mine. You can see it's nicely shaped on the side, used to chisel out the malachite. And it's absorbed the lovely colour as well. And basically, the greener they are, the older they are. This one itself is probably about 3,500 years old. Hmm. Obviously, lots of the rock is so hard that you have to use stone hammers, like the one here, to actually break it up. This would be a beach stone, yeah. and it's granite and you can see very rough on the edges oh, yeah. there where it actually has been used to chisel out the malachite. This is the great open cast where they started their mining 1860 BC. They got the easier copper on the surface and as it became more scarce were forced to dig further and further down. Finally, they cut into the side of the cliff, making the tunnels. 
quite awe-inspiring for the first archaeologists breaking into these new tunnels. And you think the last people to be here was three and a half thousand years ago. Oh, that looks a bit good, a bit dark and mysterious. That area there, you can see those very straight white markings. Oh, those there? Yes. Those are the type of thing that is actually shows as evidence that bone tools were actually used Could in areas been. like this. Could have been made yesterday, couldn't it? <laughs> Three and a half thousand years ago. Oh. The method of digging and uh, mining that they used means that they just took out the malachite and therefore these tunnels are very irregular in size. Aren't they? Some of the tunnels are actually so small we yeah. can't even fit into them. It's not really done, is it? So this is the main passage, is it? Yes. What's particularly interesting in this area is the tunnel up here. It's one of the ones we believe dug out by five or six-year-old children. So complete with two five or six-year-old sized hammer stones. to have mined it out, didn't they? Yes, they did their job well. But you can see small pieces, like the malachite up on there, oh. which give you an idea of how good the quality must have been if they left something like that. It almost looks like a sort of jeweled moss, doesn't it? Mixed in with the calcite crystals. Yeah. Those are the no value for Bronze Age miners. Four miles of tunnels have already been revealed at Great Orm and it's estimated that there are 30 miles waiting to be discovered. How long did it go on for? Straight through until 500 BC. Good grief. Mining. Yeah. About 2,000 tonnes of copper. Tonnes, tonnes of copper? Tonnes of copper. Well, how many axes would that have made? About 10 million, roughly, depending Good on size. Grief. When you think of the population of Britain at that time, they have to be trading them out with the rest of the continent. This is an incredible scale of production for a population that may never have exceeded 100,000. Copper has to be mixed with tin to make bronze, but the nearest tin mines are hundreds of miles away in Cornwall. Transporting metal over such distances requires a well-organised transport system today. So how on earth did they do it 4,000 years ago? Ten years ago, archaeologists in Dover came across a remarkable discovery. They found a huge wooden boat which was built nearly 2,000 years before Christ was born. This suggests that thousands of years ago, Britain had an advanced transport system. This road was being rebuilt to join the port of Dover with the Channel Tunnel. So it was during the course of works associated with the first land link with Europe we found the first evidence of the sea link with Europe. The timber was darkened. When we first found it, it was a very light golden brown colour, just like fresh oak. Beautiful thing. Huge logs. Trees like that just completely disappeared from Western Europe. For all its complexity, what you're really looking at here is basically four pieces of wood, two bottom planks and two side planks. But what they've done is taken a half log and then cleaved and hewed it down, leaving these shapes standing out of the wood, but to such tolerances they had to match up as mirror images of themselves so the whole thing could be fitted together. If they don't match up, the boat doesn't work. This is a Bronze Age boat. There is no metal whatsoever. There were no nails or anything like that. So how did they join the various planks together? There were two techniques. The bottom planks along the middle there are joined by timbers hammered through those rails, you see, yeah. that were left up standing. 
So that held together the bottom of the boat. The sides of the boat, what they've used here is twisted twigs of yew yeah. and literally sewed the planks together, just like you would sew two pieces of cloth together. Yes. Could it go to sea? The analysis of the hull suggests that this could travel in winds of force four or five. My instinct tells me it's more likely that we're going along the coast. About this period, flint tools disappear from the archaeological record. They imported enough bronze into this area that meant that they didn't have to use flint, which was lying all over the fields and all over the beaches. They had so much bronze, they didn't need to use it, and that's a huge amount of bronze that had to be brought in. And I think it was boats like this that brought it. The image of a Dover boat transporting goods around the coast of Britain shows a country unlike the primitive society we had once imagined. This was not a misty island of disparate tribes living in isolation, but a thriving maritime society with a network of trade routes which could also aid the spread of ideas. And ancient Britain was a country with some intriguing ideas. Here we have a little cache of stone hammers yeah. unused that they actually have placed as some sort of votive offerings. 4,000 years ago, they believed that copper grew. When yeah. something grows, you need to keep feeding it yes. to keep it growing in this area. You sometimes find stashes of mm. animal bones in nooks and crannies. They're leading a dangerous life, they are. so yeah. you need to have the gods on your side. This has to be the largest man-made underground space anywhere in prehistoric Europe. This was mining on a vast scale. Was this a Bronze Age gold rush? No, there was something else which gave these people the confidence to drive great shafts into the underworld. Many of the tools and implements made here were made as offerings. The mine itself is not just a place of work. And many of the corridors and passages here have offerings in them. There's a great deal of evidence beginning to accumulate that people in the Bronze Age believed in a supernatural world below the ground. To the people who sailed the Dover boat, this was more than just a timber vessel. It had a higher, more mystical power. At some point during its life, something very strange was done to it. Deliberately abandoned, deliberately dismantled, but dismantled in such a way that isn't easy to understand. Very specific actions took place with the boat that defy a logical explanation. I'm more and more inclined to believe that something very special is Ooh. happening when this boat is abandoned. I wonder if the place itself was somehow special, because this was abandoned Ooh. in this very dramatic place on the boundaries between sea and land. When the Romans invaded in the year 43, they discovered a religion that was thousands of years old. It's often believed that the Romans were not interested in the pagan rites of the ancient Britons. But writing in his book on the Gallic Wars, Julius Caesar is clearly fascinated by a group of politically active priests known as the Druids. Caesar is convinced that this group had its origins in Britain. The Druids are engaged in things sacred, conduct public and private sacrifices, and interpret all matters of religion. One of their leading tenets is that souls do not become extinct, but pass after death from one body to another. Thus men are excited to valor, the fear of death being disregarded. The British Museum contains a strange relic from the period in which Caesar is writing, a body found in a peat bog in Cheshire. 
He was done to death in a terrible way. He was, first of all, struck on the head with a narrow-bladed axe. Yeah. That apparently didn't kill him because the edges of the wound were swollen so right. that he survived a little bit. Yeah. He was then mm. garroted and they inserted a stick at, at the back of the neck and mm. twisted it round yeah. and then they jerked it so that uh, his spine was broken and that killed him. They carried on and cut through the jugular vein and bled him. Also, apart from an armband, which is made of fox fur, he is completely naked. The elaborate killing of a naked man, it, I think it's got to be ritual. One thinks of the Druids. I mean, do you think it's, we're looking at this sort of thing? The Druids, of course, are associated with, with human sacrifice. The other link with the Druids is that in the stomach there were also some mistletoe. <laughs> well, no, mistletoe means, means Druids. The Druids were something that Roman historians and commentators have been flagging up for decades and decades. They were the arch enemy, the Taliban of the ancient world. They're an elite priesthood. They control law and order. And it's they who lie behind the tribal resistance to the Roman invasion. The Romans took measures to destroy Druidism, ostensibly because they disapproved of the Druids' involvement in human sacrifice. But the Romans were being rather hypocritical. The Romans themselves slaughtered people for fun in the arena. So I don't think really it was on moral grounds they were suppressing Druids. I think the real reason was political. The Druids were an alternative political structure. After the conquest, British resistance was pushed further and further west, high into the mountains of Wales. By AD 60, the Druids had retreated across the Menai Straits over there to Anglesey. Now, the Romans had good reason to fear the Druids, who could inspire fanatical loyalty in their followers. There's a standoff at the Menai Straits. The Romans come face to face with the Druid forces across the water. The Roman author Tacitus described the scene. On the opposite shore stood the Britons, close embodied and prepared for action. Women were seen running through the ranks in wild disorder, their apparel funereal, their hair loose to the wind, in their hands flaming torches, and their whole appearance the frantic rage of the Furies. It is the embodiment of terror. The Romans stand frozen looking across the Menai Strait, absolutely petrified. And Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, the Roman governor, galvanises them because he knows that if he can get them to invade Anglesey and beat them, he will be a hero. Yeah. And this is going to be one of the most brilliant events because Britain will be secured. This Druid resistance, this Druid influence, which has spread not only just across Britain but well into Gaul, hmm. will be ended once and forever. The shouts of their general gave the troops renewed vigour. They rushed onto the attack with impetuous fury. The island fell. The religious groves, dedicated to superstition and barbarous rites, were levelled to the ground. The Britons perished in their own flames. But of course the Roman governor has made a huge political blunder because something else is going on behind him a few miles away. What the Roman generals had neglected in their eagerness to destroy the Druids was the revolt of Boudicca. The furious warrior queen amassed an army and sacked the towns of Colchester and London. This is the most terrible event in Roman Britain's history. And so the whole of southeastern Britain goes up in flames, while Suetonius Paulinus, with most of the Roman army, is fighting a war in northwest Wales, a difficult place to get back from quickly today, let alone in the year 60. Why did the Romans risk such a humiliating defeat in the south in order to suppress a bunch of strange priests in Wales? What powers did this religion hold?
This is Seahenge, the remains of a circle of 55 wooden posts surrounding the trunk of an enormous oak tree cut down over 4,000 years ago. It was some distance inland when it was made. The huge tree trunk at the centre of this extraordinary shrine was turned completely upside down before it was placed into the ground. I am certain that the people who did this believed in another world, another dimension beneath the ground. When the Romans invaded, Britain was no barbaric outpost, but a fertile, industrious nation, separated from the rest of Europe, which flourished in a unique and spectacular way. But the Romans also discovered something else. These were people so brave in battle, it was as if they had no fear of death. The Romans dismissed this as the unthinking courage of savages. But they were wrong. The people of ancient Britain had a system of belief which had helped them come to terms with their own mortality. <laughs> 